St. Andrews has brought me nearer to Jesus and continues to in new ways every day. We are invited into following Jesus on the way of life. I feel like I'm at home when I'm here, and my relationship with the Lord has just begun. I didn't have one until I came here, and I'm so thankful. I really see the heart of Jesus in this community, and it's just like one beautiful, multi-generational family. That's what the entire Bible is about, You're receiving the goodness of God and His mercy and grace and forgiveness, and that being the catalyst and the power to step on the journey of following Him following Jesus. God put that in us, a natural desire to serve, serve Him, serve others, and that's what we're doing here. Every year at Easter, we read from one of the four Gospels, the four accounts of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This year, we read from the book of John. John 20, 1 to 18. We'll have it on the screen, but as our custom here at St. Andrews, I invite you, if you are able, to stand for the reading of God's Word so that God perhaps can get our attention as we change our posture. John 20, verses 1 to 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and, and believed they did still not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will go get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. You may have a seat. When you think of Easter, if you've been around perhaps, maybe you've been around Easter for most of or all of your life, or maybe you just know about the details of Easter. Perhaps you envisioned that empty tomb scene to look something like this. Somewhere in the mid-morning with the sun shining brightly, but we read here in that very first verse, the first sentence in John 20, one of those little details that is so important to everything else that took place. 
early on the first day of the week, that's the Sunday after he was crucified on Friday, while it was still dark. It was dark when Mary left those other men and women, the disciples who were gathered together trying to make sense of everything that had happened. In their grief, there was darkness. When Jesus was on the cross, the Father made everything dark as Jesus suffered and died. And then as the day wore on, Yes, it became dark on Friday night and was perhaps bright on Saturday and dark on Saturday night. But for Mary and Peter and John and the rest of the followers of Jesus, that darkness didn't dissipate. It didn't go away. That darkness was like a bone-crushing darkness. A darkness that just held them captive. A darkness of uncertainty. A darkness of pain, a darkness of grief, but more than that, what now? No clarity, no plan, no direction, no future, perhaps no unity among those followers of Jesus. He was the center of the family that he had built, those followers. And so Mary came in the dark, but also came with a cloud of darkness overwhelming her. But she still had to be with Jesus. Something about Mary and her relationship to him. All we know about her, she's from a city called Magdala. And she had had a, a really serious issue in her life that we don't know the details of, but Jesus had freed her from that. And from that point on, she, with men and women that followed Christ, she was devoted to him. She loved him. She needed to be with him. She needed to hold him. She came while it was still dark in the midst of her darkness because she had to see him. That face, those words, that smile, those eyes. The Lord she'd given everything to who had given everything to her. He was now dead, but he wasn't gone. She went to the tomb to prepare the body, but to hold him. I, I will carry him. I will take care of him. Just tell me where he is in her darkness. <clears throat> you know, it's, we read that in verse 2 that, that she saw that the tomb was empty. Somehow the Roman soldiers had left, and that big stone that was in front of the tomb had been rolled away, so she didn't know what to do. So what did she do? She, she runs to the, the other disciples and looks for some of the leaders of the disciples, and she finds Peter and, and John and says, they've taken him. So Peter and John, they also take off running in the dark. And John gets there first. He's younger. And he stops at the entrance as he peers in, and Peter bolts right into the tomb, and he sees that linen that they had known had wrapped Jesus' body laying there and there was no body. And then John went in and he sees that cloth and that was also laying there. Peter and John saw this and what happened? They went back home. They left. They were, they were confused. They were fearful. They were wondering what to do. There was no clarity, no plan, no direction. And so their response to the empty tomb was to go back home, go back with the others. But Mary stayed. Do you notice that? She stayed. Weeping, in fact, the, the word that's described as weeping is more like a heaving, an emotional out pouring of her grief and pain, wanting so desperately to see Jesus, and they've taken him away. Darkness. You know, if there's ever a year where Easter really can grab hold of us, it's this year, because we have all known darkness. 
We know what it's like to have no clarity. We know what it's like to try to formulate a plan to survive this when we really don't know what's around the bend. Maybe we've been angry. Maybe we've been fearful. Maybe we have become complacent. We've narrowed our relationships. Scholars tell us that we have 80% less human relationships at the end of COVID than we did before it started. 80%, yet we were wired for community. That's why we're so grateful to be together here. There's still plenty of darkness. And, and we run in the dark. We weep in the dark. I had a friend who was here at the Good Friday service a couple days ago, and so I asked her when we were just chatting for a while, and, and we had this kind of relationship. I said, how's, how's it been for you? She said, it's been horrible. It's been so painful. I got COVID somewhere around Christmas, and so did my mom, who I lived with, and neither one of us had the strength or energy to be able to take care of each other. And it was the most difficult thing we've gone through. We all have our own darkness. And even pre-COVID, in these beautiful songs we have sung today, have you noticed the recognition, the confession, the opening up of our vulnerabilities because we run in the dark. We did even before COVID hit us. We try to bring clarity, but we find ourselves lost and alone so often. We try to run, even in the midst of our darkness. And that is what Mary felt, and those disciples. She went back to the tomb that even in the midst of her darkness and her grief, she had to see him. Well, he wasn't there, so she ran, and they ran, and they went home, and she stayed. And you know, you know what happened there. A blogger named Jack, Zach Eswine writes this. Those disciples can leave without Jesus, but Mary can't. Their choice between going on home or wrestling and weeping in the dark. Mary stayed, wrestled and wept in the dark. The light of Christ breaks into that darkness, and John and Peter missed it. There's grace for them. They will receive, but, but they missed the moment. Oh, that moment when Mary in her heaving, in her outpouring of grief, the two angels with great comfort entered into her story, entered into her pain as they say, why, why do you cry? And then she hears something, someone behind her and she thinks it's the gardener. Then this one says, Mary, why do you cry? Who it is you look for? And she says, wherever you've taken him, please tell me and I will go and I will take him home. I will hold him. I will help him. And then he says her name, Mary. Now, those of you that have been around St. Andrews since I've been here, roughly four years, and a lot of you have been here before, and it's so wonderful to have you back. You may go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've been to four Easter services, and every year I think this guy mentions Mary. And you may be writing that down and wondering what you're going to talk about at Easter, okay? You bring up Mary again. Well, why? The men ran. The closest disciples ran. A woman wasn't even allowed to be a witness. And yet she was the one that Jesus had revealed himself to because she stayed. She wept. She grieved. She loved. And he said her name. We don't know when the darkness dispelled. We don't know how long Jesus was there. Would it be possible that he was actually there the whole time knowing Mary was going to come? Would it be possible that he was standing there as she went right by him to the tomb? As she ran back to the disciples, perhaps he was still standing there, the risen Christ. Then the two disciples running right by him, going inside and then running back home. We have no idea when Jesus actually 
arrived. But what we do know is when he said her name, the stone that had covered the tomb was shattered. The darkness was cast aside and the bright light of the risen Christ was there for Mary as she heard her name. When Jesus says your name, no one else can quite come close. My friends, that's what Easter means. He has come to pay the price for the things that hold us back, the tombs that we carry, the darkness that forever envelops us. He has come to shatter that, to forgive us, to scrub us clean, to take away the guilt and the shame and the fear and the lostness and the anger and to replace it with the light of the glory of the risen Christ who knows your name. That's why John wrote in John 3, 16, the first half of it says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. That word world is the word cosmos, which means all of creation. But see, it's not just this grand scheme that God has. And we say, what about me? <laughs> no, for God so loved Mary that he gave his only Son. For God so loved chap. He gave his only son. For God so loved you that he gave his only son so that whosoever shall trust in him shall never die but have eternal life. Eternal life is the gift, the presence of the risen Christ. Whoever trusts in him will never experience darkness again because he knows your name. That's the good news. Now, I want you to remember that Mary's circumstances never changed. Did you notice that? There were still the Roman officials who were very dangerous. There were still the Jewish leaders that had plotted to kill Jesus and maybe his followers. There was still great uncertainty in terms of what they were to do, but everything had changed for Mary. She had been brought into the light of Christ when he said her name, Mary. He gave her courage. He gave her hope. He gave her meaning. He gave her purpose. And he gave her the promise that he will always be there with her and for her to forgive everything inside of her that holds her back in her darkness, to, to be with her in the midst of dark circumstances, knowing that the light has come. My friends, Jesus Christ knows your name. everything about you. And he died and rose again to call you by name, to trust him and enter the light. That is Easter. That's why we celebrate. That's why we gather, because he knows our name. Maybe this Easter, wherever you are, Whatever you're going through, whatever you're experiencing with your own personal brand of darkness, know that the light has dawned, the king has risen, and your savior and friend has come to rescue you from the kingdom of darkness. He knows your name. He is risen. You know, that was okay, because you have masks on, that might be okay, but you know what? Let's do that one more time like we actually mean it because he knows your name. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. May we sing hallelujah to the King of kings and Lord of lords.